Deuteronomy chapter 31 is where we'll be. Deuteronomy 31. We'll begin by reading that whole chapter. Deuteronomy chapter 31. And Moses went and spake these words unto all Israel. And he said unto them, I am an hundred and twenty years old this day. I can no more go out and come in. Also the Lord hath said unto me, Thou shalt not go over this Jordan. The Lord thy God, he will go over before thee. And he will destroy these nations from before thee. And thou shalt possess them. And Joshua, he shall go over before thee, as the Lord hath said. And the Lord shall do unto them as he did unto Sihon and to Og, kings of the Amorites, and unto the land of them whom he destroyed. And the Lord shall give them up before your face, that ye may do unto them according unto all the commandment which I have commanded you. Be strong and of a good courage. Fear not, nor be afraid of them. For the Lord thy God, he it is that doth go with thee. He will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. And Moses called unto Joshua and said unto him, In the sight of all Israel, Be strong and of a good courage, for thou must go with this people unto the land which the Lord hath sworn unto their fathers to give them, and thou shalt cause them to inherit it. And the Lord, he it is that doth go before thee, he will be with thee, he will not fail thee, neither forsake thee, fear not, neither be dismayed. And Moses wrote this law and delivered it unto the priests, the sons of Levi, which bear the ark of the covenant of the Lord, and unto all the elders of Israel. And Moses commanded them, saying, At the end of every seven years, in the solemnity of the year of release, in the feast of the tabernacles, when all Israel is come to appear before the Lord thy God in the place which he shall choose, thou shalt read this law before all Israel in their hearing. Gather the people together, men and women and children, and the stranger that is within thy gates, that he may hear, and that they may learn and fear the Lord your God, and observe to do all the words of this law. And that their children, which have not known anything, may hear and learn to fear the Lord your God, as long as ye live in the land, whether ye go over Jordan to possess it. And the Lord shall, or the Lord said unto Moses, Behold, this thy days be approached. Sorry, behold, thy days approach that thou must die. Call Joshua and present yourselves in the tabernacle of the congregation, that I may give him a charge. And Moses and Joshua went and presented themselves in the tabernacle of the congregation. And the Lord appeared in the tabernacle in a pillar of a cloud. And the pillar of the cloud stood over the door of the tabernacle. And the Lord said unto Moses, Behold, thou shalt sleep with thy fathers, and this people will rise up and go a-whoring after the gods of the strangers of the land, whither they go to be among them, and will forsake me, and break my covenant which I have made with them. Then my anger shall be kindled against them in that day, and I will forsake them, and I will hide my face from them, and they shall be devoured, and many evils and troubles shall befall them, so that they will say in that day, are not these evils come upon us because our God is not among us? And I will surely hide my face in that day for all the evils which they have wrought, in that they are turned unto other gods. Now therefore write ye this song for you, and teach it, to the, chil teach it the children of Israel. Put it in their mouths, that this song may be a witness for me against the children of Israel. For when I shall have brought them into the land which I swear unto their fathers that floweth with milk and honey and they shall have eaten and filled themselves and waxen fat then will they turn unto the other gods and serve them and provoke me to break my covenant and it shall come to pass when many evils and troubles are befallen them that this song shall testify against them as a witness for it shall not be forgotten out of the mouths of their seed for I know their imagination which they go about, even now before I have brought them into the land which I swear. Moses therefore wrote this song the same day, and taught it 
to the children of Israel. And he gave Joshua the son of Nun a charge and said, Be strong and of a good courage, for thou shalt bring the children of Israel into the land which I swear unto them, and I will be with thee. And it came to pass when Moses had made an end of writing the words of this law in the book until they were finished, that Moses commanded the Levites which bear the ark of the covenant of the Lord, saying, Take this book of the law and put it in the side of the ark of the covenant of the Lord your God, that it may be there for a witness against thee. For I know thy rebellion and thy stiff neck. Behold, while I am yet alive with you this day, ye have been rebellious against the Lord, and how much more after my death. Gather unto me all the elders of your tribes and your officers, that I may speak these words in their ears, and call heaven and earth to record against them. For I know that after my death you will utterly corrupt yourselves and turn aside from the way which I have commanded you, and evil will befall you in the latter days, because ye will do evil in the sight of the Lord, to provoke him to anger, though the work through the work of your hands. And Moses spake in the ears of all the congregation of Israel the words of this song until they were ended. And obviously the next chapter is this very song he's talking about. Now, here in Deuteronomy chapter 31, I believe what we have is a a recall of what has already taken place in Numbers chapter 27. So keep your finger there and turn with me to Numbers chapters 27 just quickly. <clears throat> and in Numbers 27 you find in verse 18 the beginning of the charge to Joshua the son of Nun. This whole chapter seems to be dealing with the succession, the transfer of the power and the responsibility over the children of Israel from Moses unto Joshua. In Numbers 27, it's where we first find in verse 18 these words. And the Lord said unto Moses, Take thee Joshua the son of Nun, a man in whom is the Spirit, and lay thine hand upon him. So this particular spirit, I believe, being the Spirit of God, was in Joshua and, and flourished there for his obedience. And he says... This man whom has the spirit, the hand of Moses was to be laid upon him. Continuing in verse 9, it said, And set him before Eleazar the priest, and before all the congregation, and give him a charge in their sight. And thou shalt put some of thine honor upon him, that all the congregation of the children of Israel may be obedient. So what's happening here is that there's a man who has the spirit. It's, it's visible, and God signifies the same, telling Moses to proceed with laying hands upon him. And what that does is it gives some of Moses' honor unto Joshua at this time. His glory, his majesty, essentially his visage before the people is what it's talking about here. Ceremoniously, Joshua is set before Eliezer the priest and Moses puts his hands upon him and says, this is the man that will have some of my honor, essentially that will carry it forward. Now, why not all of the honor? Well, because Moses is obviously still alive at this time. Verse 21, it continues and says, And he shall stand before Eliezer the priest, who shall ask counsel for him after the judgment of Urim before the Lord. So Eliezer the priest is going to God for counsel before the people, before Moses, before Joshua, in regard to Joshua going forward and leading. It says, At his word they shall go out, and at his word they shall come in, both he and all the children of Israel with him, even all the congregation, signifying the spiritual um, significance of this situation here. That the leadership comes, going in and going out, based on the counsel here and the foresight of God. Verse 22, it says, And Moses did as the Lord commanded him, and he took Joshua and set him before Eleazar the priest, and before all the congregation, and he laid hands upon him, and gave him a charge as the Lord commanded by the hand of Moses. So here they're following through with exactly what God expected. Now back in Deuteronomy chapter 23, while that initial um, process took place, where some of the honor was given unto Joshua that Moses took, I think essentially Joshua here at this time in Numbers took on a, a 
a, a, a vice position, you know, vice president, vice leader, vice over Israel at this time. He was in training. He was secondary to Moses, who was their spiritual leader. Some of the honor going upon him, Moses aging as he got into Deuteronomy. And then at the time of Deuteronomy, we find this full transfer is about to take place. And all of Moses' honor and responsibility will be given unto Joshua. The spirit found in Joshua first. He received by hands the honor that Moses placed upon him, and the transfer began to take place. Back in Deuteronomy chapter 31, we find this transition continue. Verse 1, it says, And Moses went and spake all these words unto all Israel. And I don't know if you noticed, but as I was reading, I circled another one. All Israel is mentioned, I believe, four times here, and that's who is being, who is being admonished, who is, who is being demonstrated what's going on to, who is, who is witnessing this very thing that is taking place. Verse 2 then it says, And he said unto them, all Israel, I am 120 years old this day. I can no more go out and come in. Also the Lord hath said unto me, Thou shalt not go over this Jordan. So Moses is starting to admit his frailty. I can't go out. I can't come in. In other words, I can no longer fulfill in the fullness that role. I gave it in part to Joshua back there in Numbers 27, but now it's just futile. I can't go out. I can't come in. I'm 120 years old, he says to the people at this time. And then he also admonishes them that the Lord has already said to him, He's not going to go over into Jordan anyways. And I bet at this time, as they were sitting on the crest of the water, or at the brink of the water, they would just were itching to get into that promised land. They couldn't wait to get into that promised land. And so essentially he's saying, I must go that you can proceed. We have to transfer the power here. Some of my honor, all of my honor has to continue on and go with you in the form of another leader. And that's going to be Joshua at this time. So verse 3, it says, the Lord thy God, he will go over before thee, and he will destroy these nations from before thee, and thou shalt possess them. And Joshua, he shall go over before thee, as the Lord hath said. The acknowledgement here is that the Lord will go, and the leader will go, and both will charge before the people Israel at this time as they enter in to possess the promised land. And I bet you at this point they couldn't wait. He's acknowledging then here that not only does God lead and in, is he in charge, but there's a leader here that leads and is in charge and leads the people in the direction that they ought to go. Now, whenever I read these discussions about um, authority, some people get uncomfortable, but some people willingly acknowledge that what is happening here is a good thing. I've learned in my life that there is safety under authority, okay? Okay. So when I'm a, an employee, you've got to make your boss be over you. And there's safety in having that authority over you and being under them. I told somebody the other day while I was working with them out on the floor, I'm like, look, this document has a sign-off for your group leader. I'm like, go to them and make them sign it off. Do you know what that does for you? Relinquishes your responsibility. That way, if something goes bad down the line, it's not on you. Your boss acknowledged it, and your boss is like this hedge of protection for you. You're not paid enough to take on that kind of responsibility, so don't do it. Just be responsible for what you need to be responsible, and accept that safety under the authority that you have. So employees, make your boss sign off your work. Be under his authority. Let him make the decisions where he needs to, and that way you are simply obeying orders. Wives, Ask your husbands to make the call and yield the decisions unto them. That just makes sense. And that way you are safe. You are protected from the consequence, not necessarily all the consequences, but necessarily you're protected in that situation, being under authority. Other examples, children obey your parents. And us as believers give honor unto our spiritual leaders. And I have them in my own life that I give honor unto. I go to them and in their authority, I look to them to help me in scenarios so that I'm not always just doing things my own way. I believe that everyone in all ways has somebody that they ought to be under authority wise. And if you're a husband and you're the head of the house, do you know who you are under? You're under God. And everybody ought to put themselves and relinquish the authority to major decisions to God Almighty God. The Bible says, in all thy ways, acknowledge him and he shall direct thy paths. And that's you giving up 
the responsibility and the authority in all thy ways to God Almighty God. And what a great thing to do. That means you acknowledge him, you know him, you, you, uh, you consider him, and you, and you go to him with all decisions that you need to make. It's that you give God the permission to intervene in your life, and that is a blessed place to be in. In all thy ways acknowledge him, he shall direct thy paths. And he's only going to leave you in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. That's a good thing, and that's a blessing. We continue on in Num or Deuteronomy 31. Verse 4, it says, And the Lord shall do unto them as he did unto Sihon and to Og, king of the Amorites, and unto the land of them whom he destroyed. And the Lord shall give them up before your face, that ye may do unto them according unto all the commandments which I have commanded you. Go to Deuteronomy chapter 12 very quickly. Deuteronomy chapter 12. <clears throat> He said there that you're going to go and see the enemy fall according to all that the, the commandments which he has commanded you. God here commands that there would be victory in their lives. And he did that in one place back in Deuteronomy chapter 12. It says in verse 1, These are the statutes and judgments which ye shall observe to do in the land which the Lord thy God of thy fathers giveth thee to possess it. All the days that ye live upon the earth, it says here, ye shall utterly destroy all the places wherein the nations which ye shall possess serve their gods, upon the high mountains and upon the hills and upon every green tree. Now that means that me particular as just some guy in Israel, a father of a household, is going to be going and destroy these things. No, I believe God here is making a command to the people that this will take place. He's acknowledging that this is their future. And do you know how that's going to play out? God's going to go forth for them. Then their leader, Joshua, is going to go forth for them. And they are going to follow in their paths. And as a result, utterly destroy these places and these nations. Of course, they will play their part. But their most important part is to follow who's leading. God, Joshua, and then after that, who's ever the authorities in their particular household and what have you. just continues down. Verse 3, it says, And ye shall overthrow their altars and break their pillars, burn their groves with fire, and ye shall hew down the graven images of their gods. Destroy the names of them out of that place. Ye shall not do so unto the Lord your God, but unto the place which the Lord thy God shall choose out of all your tribes, to put his name there, even unto his habitation shall ye seek, and thither thou shalt come. And thither ye shall bring the burnt offerings, and your sacrifices, and your tithes, your heave offerings, your of your hand, your vows, your free will offerings of your firstlings, and the herds of your flock. And there ye shall eat before the Lord your God, and watch this, and shall rejoice in all that ye put your hand unto you, ye and your households, wherein the Lord your God hath blessed thee. God here is commanding that this will be their future if they're obedient and they follow and observe to do what's according to the law. They will utterly destroy all the people. God will have the leadership, will have them succeed in this area. Also, God will have the leadership to lead them to eat and rejoice in all that they do. And who will take part in that? Ye and your households. Everybody will take part in this wonderful command, this wonderful promise that God hath made. Go back to Deuteronomy chapter 31. And so all the people were to receive of this wonderful blessing that God's putting forward. But he does so with a proper order of things. God will go before thee. Joshua shall go before thee. And the people march on afterwards. Verse 6, it says, Be strong and of a good courage. Fear not, nor be afraid of them. For the Lord thy God, he it is that doth go with thee. He will not fail thee, and nor forsake thee. So there's the promise. God's going before you. He's going to make sure it happens. He's going to make sure everything plays out exactly as is promised. And the people's responsibility is simply to trust and obey and follow after God through the arm of his intended and, and ordained leadership at that time. When God speaks, his authority then transfers to whoever he's given the authority in his particular situation. Here it's Joshua when he speaks, you ought to listen. And this is important. His charge to them is simple. Be strong. Be courageous. Fear not and don't be afraid. Why? Because God is with thee and God will go before thee. 
He says in all of these things, when you're to go and to obey and to trust and to be strong, he says, when you do so, it will be well with you. You hear this all the time. That it may be well with thee. That it may be well with thee. Obey God that it may be well with thee. And this is the promise that God intends to give back to them if they will only trust and obey and fall into their proper roles in the, in the hierarchy of the authority structure that God has placed. And that is the safest place to be. Verse 7, And Moses called unto Joshua and said unto him, In the sight of all Israel, Be strong and of a good courage, for thou must go with this people unto the land which the Lord hath sworn unto their fathers to give them, and unto, or and thou shalt cause them to inherit it. And the Lord, he it is that doth go before thee, he will be with thee, he will not fail thee, neither forsake thee, fear not, neither be dismayed. So Moses here, it's the charge from God, be strong and of a good courage. He brings his man that he's about to transfer leadership to before all the people and gives him that same charge to be strong and of a good courage. He heard the charge, received the charge, applied the charge, and then gave the charge forth. And that's how we got to be with the Word of God. When God speaks something in your ears, receive it, apply it, and then give it off to somebody else. Dads are going to have young children after them that need to learn the same charge that they were charged of the Lord. Moms, the same thing, have charges that they're given from God, from their leadership that they need to transfer on to the people that are following after them. The young children and anybody that you would have a responsibility and an authority and a leadership role over top. And this is how God's nation grows and flourishes by everybody heeding what they hear from Almighty God and transferring it down to people as they can. It's not one of these scenarios with Moses and with Joshua and with the people where do as I say and not as I do. Joshua was fully willing to hear what God had told to Moses, receive it from Moses and transfer it on to the people and do as he was commanded from God at that time. We continue on in verse 9. It says, And Moses wrote this law and delivered it unto the priests, the sons of Levi, which bear the ark of the covenant of the Lord and unto all the elders of Israel. And Moses commanded them saying at the end of every seven years in the solemnity of the year of release in the feasts of the tabernacles, when all Israel is come to appear before the Lord thy God in the place which he shall choose Thou shalt read this law before all Israel in their hearing. And so the year of release, at the timing of the Feast of the Tabernacle, all Israel gathers together every seven years. And at that festival, and at that time, at that appointed time, they hear the Word of God read in their audience. And this would have been Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Read before all the people. It's like Timothy was charged. Till I come, give attendance to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. Look how important reading is. And so God had it that his leadership would bring before all the people the reading of the entirety of the scriptures that they had at that time so that they could hear reading. And he charged his leaders to give attendance unto that, that exhortation and doctrine. Leaders need to be seeing read. If you are a leader, if you are a dad, if you are a mom, you need to be seeing red. Reading, exhortation, doctrine. Reading, exhortation, doctrine. And that's super important to the believer, especially one in leadership that is trying to teach generations to come of the acts of God and lead them into following them. It should be a big part of ministry. Not just my ministry, but your ministry. God wants all of us to get involved in that, and that's why he makes it so important that the law be read before his people, that they will hear it, that they will heed it, and that they will observe to do it. And all Israel is here. Nobody is exempt from enjoying the scriptures being read in public. Verse 12, it continues, Gather the people together, men and women and children, and thy stranger that is within thy gates, that they may hear... And that they may learn and fear the Lord your God and observe to do all the words of the law. So they need to hear, they need to learn, 
and they need to fear so that they can observe to do all that the Lord God has given them in that law. So that's why we listen to the word of God so that we can hear the word of God. That's why we listen to the word of God so that we can learn the word of God. That's why we listen to the word of God so we can fear the word of God. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and wisdom is taking everything you've learned and practically applying it, observing to do these things. This is how great nations are grown under the teaching and the hearing of the word of God. A great people is certainly created in that same environment. In verse 13, and continues in that thought, all the people, it says, are coming together to hear that they can observe. And it says in verse 13, and that their children, which have not known anything, may hear and learn and fear the Lord your God, as long as ye live in the land, whether ye go over Jordan to possess it. And so this is something that has to be continuous, that the children, which know not anything, hear that same truth. And generationally, the next children, which have heard no thing of this sort, hear those truths. Reading, exhortation, doctrine, that they can hear, learn, and fear, and observe to do, and continue, and continue, and continue, is what God here is thrusting into the hearts of his people, and what Moses is encouraging that they would continue to do. But it's not without his doubts and his worries for these people. It says in verse 14, And the Lord said unto Moses, Behold, thy days approach that thou must die. Could you imagine God coming to you and saying, The day's approaching that you're going to die. How much would come through your mind? You're you're concerned for your family members that you haven't reached out to with the gospel yet. You're concerned for your, your loved ones. I would think of my wife. I would think of my children. I would be concerned for them for all the things that I had not done, the loose ends that I had not tied up up to that point. And Moses here, hears those fateful words. Thou must die. Thou must die. And it must have been running through his mind. The people are still rebellious. The people are still not united. The people have still not heard the word of God in its fullness. The people have not done this and that. And this. And he must have had all of these concerns and all of these worries for his people that he has led all of this time in the wilderness. And though he had been frustrated with them, he certainly loved them and had a heart and a desire for them to get right, to follow God. Because that's what you hear through all of these books. A pressing of these people. A forcing of them into the door, which is Christ. The Lord says, Behold thy days approach that thou must die. And what a moment for a Selah. You see that in the Psalms. Thou must die, Selah. Just think about that for a moment. What it would be like to hear from God that your days are numbered. It's coming. Have you today finished all that you need to finish? Have you done all that you need to done? Have, have, have you spoken to all the people that you need to speak to? The day has come that thou must die. And I believe that when that Word is spoken to me if I ever hear it in my ear, or I know and I'm impressed that, you know what? The time's up. I'm about to die. I want to be prepared in that day, having the greatest possible legacy that I could have already set for me. And the greatest legacy that you could leave, more than wealth, more than fame, more than success, is your children. The greatest possible legacy is to have children after you. Not just biological necessarily, but also children in the Lord. People that you have ministered unto. You have taught the word of God. You have led in that right and good way. The Apostle Paul had many children. He called Timothy a child of the faith, but we know Timothy had a Greek father. Well, it wasn't Paul that was his biological father, but no doubt the, the, the Apostle Paul took on many children and adopted them in the faith. And that's the greatest legacy that we could have when God says to us, Thou must die. The days approach that thou must die. We should be able to look back and say, you know what? I've done my best to minister. I have a legacy of great Christians, great people that fear God, love the Lord, coming up behind me. And Lord, I am ready. I've certainly not done it all. I've certainly not arrived. I've certainly not finished my course and done everything perfect along the way. But I've left a legacy of children Though they did not know anything, they've heard, they've learned, and they fear God, and they're observing to do these things. And that's the greatest legacy that we could have, and that's a legacy that we can start to work on today. That legacy of children, which hear, which learn, which understand and fear God, Almighty God, is the greatest thing. That they would know God, 
that they would love him. That's what I want to be behind me is, is, is a child, a children, and, 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 and many more perhaps that know God and fear him and love him and want to get after him. That's what I want to be said of me when my day to die must come. In the beginning and the ending of that verse, verse 14, it says, Call Joshua and present yourselves in the tabernacle of the congregation that I may give him a charge. And Moses and Joshua went and presented themselves in the tabernacle of the congregation. And the Lord appeared in the tabernacle in a pillar of a cloud. And the pillar of a cloud stood over the door of the tabernacle. So here he says, Moses, you're going to die. The time has come. Bring Joshua that I may give him a charge. But first here, we're going to find that God spent some time finalizing Moses with a charge of his own, finalizing his time in his ministry. And look at verse 16. And it said, And the Lord said unto Moses, So Moses gathers Joshua, brings Joshua down, appears in the tabernacle, a pillar of a cloud falls upon that very tabernacle. And verse 16, And the Lord said unto Moses, Behold, thou shalt sleep with thy fathers. And this people will rise up and go whoring after the gods of the strangers of the land, whither they go to be among them, and will forsake me and break my covenant which I have made with them. Again, what a, what a sad state of affairs. <laughs> Not very encouraging for Moses who is about to pass on the torch, as it were, to Joshua after him to follow in his steps. The first thing that he hears from God is God says, come down here that I may give Joshua, your successor, a charge. He says to Moses, behold, the people that are going to be following after you and following after Joshua are going to rebel. They're going to forsake me. They're going to break my covenant. Continues in verse 17, he says, then my anger shall be kindled against them in that day and I will forsake them. And I will hide my face from them, and they shall be devoured. And many evils and troubles shall befall them, so that they will say in that day, Are not these evils come upon us, because our God is not among us? And I will surely hide my face in that day for all the evils which they shall have wrought, in that they are turned unto other gods. So we saw God there promising that in his anger he will forsake the people. Did he just turn away and leave them for no reason at all? No. He forsook them because they forsook him first. The same is true. If ye love me, I will love you. He loved us first. And then we give him that love and we have that connection. But here God says, you get what you want. You want to forsake me? You want to break my covenant? I will forsake you in the same way and break that same covenant. And then all these many evils will come upon you and you will certainly face the result of what you have wrought in that day. You will reap what you sow if you turn unto other gods and forsake the God of your fathers. What a sad story here. But it's simply an example of the hearts of men. Moses, I believe, believe, had heard God, had learned of God, had feared God. And in the best of his ability, even penning the very scriptures that were to be read in the audience of the people so that when he dies, his legacy would be these scriptures that he had helped to produce under the power of the Holy Ghost. He had trained up Joshua to lead this very people and done his best, I believe, though not perfect. He had done his best to lead the people in that right and good way and leave Joshua with the people that was destined to follow after and seek God. But the truth is that the hearts of men are deceptive, deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it but God Almighty God? And so God here promises that though you've done all of these things, Moses, they will certainly turn from me. We need to remember, though, that these people always had that opportunity to turn back. And so Moses, though he does hear this charge that essentially these people are going to turn away, he doesn't leave off to leave them with what they need to return unto him. And that's the word of God. God wasn't among them and promised to not be among them because they had forsaken him. But here he's going to give them one of the greatest tools that they could ever have for seeking after God. And this is the same for us. Verse 19. Now therefore, write ye this song for you, and teach it in the, cho 
and teach it the children of Israel, put it in their mouths, that this song may be a witness for me against the children of Israel. Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your hearts to the Lord. I can do that with hymns that I've learned through song and scriptures that I've learned through song. You know what I can also do that with? Heavy metal music that I heard. <laughs> music has this way of getting in your brain and sticking there. And so Moses, under the leading of God, brings a song to the people as a witness against them. And they were to sing this song and they were to learn this song. And while he could have given them the law and read it to them every seven years, do you know what's really going to stick with the people of Israel? I believe it's this song that he's about to give them. It's the hymns that he's about that he has given them before and you'll find them in Psalms. This is what really is going to stick with the people. And so he gives this song to teach them and to show them the witness of God against them. And that was his whole purpose in giving it to them. I've learned many things and memorized many things through putting them into song. And Moses was wise to this. And so he presents a song to them along with the charge and along with the scriptures, the whole package, everything they need to obey. And though God's obviously indicating to them, one of these days I'll turn in anger against this people. But at least they'll know. At least they won't be without a witness. And that's what Moses here gave them through songs. Continue in verse 20. For when I shall have brought them into the land which I swear into their fathers that floweth with milk and honey, and they shall have eaten and filled themselves and waxen fat, then will they turn unto other gods and serve them and provoke me and break my covenant. And it shall come to pass when many evils and troubles are befallen them that this song shall testify against them the witness, for it shall not be forgotten out of the mouths of their seed. You see that? It shall not be forgotten out of the mouths of their seed. For I know their imagination. He knows how their brains work, essentially. He knows how, how images can enter in and can have more of an impression on somebody than simply a word spoken. He says, I know their imagination, which they go about, even now, before I have brought them into the land which I swear. So our imaginations can be used for all sorts of things. And usually, they tend to draw us into the wrong thoughts and the wrong ideals. That's why we're to take our imaginations and bring them into the captivity of Christ. Imaginations can serve positive and good. Uh, and also darkness and evil. Your imagination is simply something that God gave you, a faculty that you have in your brain that allows you to image what is being heard or spoken or, or seen and you can retain things in a different way. Think things through. And, and, and there's nothing necessarily inherently wrong with the imagination, but in the wrong hands, your imagination can take you down a dark path, certainly. But God here indicates that he's going to give them a song which shall never be forgotten out of the mouths of their seeds, knowing their imagination and what it is capable of. Verse 22, Moses therefore wrote this song the same day. With zeal he brings this song to them. And it says, And taught it the children of Israel. And he gave Joshua the son of Nun a charge and said, Be strong and of a good courage. For thou shalt bring the children of Israel into the land which I swear unto them, and I will be with thee. And so the song is wrote and the charge is given. And it's amazing because the same charge that was given to Joshua is the same charge that was given to Moses, is the same charge that was given to all the people. In Joshua 1 and verse 6, he says to them, Be strong and of a good courage. For unto this people shalt thou divide for an inheritance the land which I swear unto their fathers to give them. And you know what? The same thing happens here. God speaks in my ear every Sunday morning and throughout the week. A message I believe that he wants me to give to you. But you know what happens first? He charges me with that same message. I don't stand up here and browbeat people about things that have nothing to do with me. Most of these messages touch me before I ever stand up here, and they continue to work in me the weeks that follow. There are some messages that God worked years and years and years into me and impressed these ideas into me and helped me to live these ideas, and then I presented them in a sermon. And then he continues to bring and highlight different ideas about them afterwards, and I'm continuing to grow in those same things. Of course, not everything I stand up here before you and preach is something that I'm a master of. 
No, we all have to grow. And that's why it's important for us to take the charges of God and transfer them to other people, that they can grow thereby. We're not to bring the word of God into captivity for ourselves and say, this is just mine. No, we're to share it with others. And this is how God creates a, a wonderful and, 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 and fruitful atmosphere among his people and among the families that would be named by his name is when the charge that he gives in the ears of the leadership blesses them, encourages them, strengthens, teaches them, admonishes them, and then they take what they have learned and they bring it to the people under them, the children or, or, their, or their spouses or what have you. And he teaches them the same truths, brings that same charge to them at that time. In verse 24, and it says, It came to pass, when Moses had made an end of writing the words of this law in a book until they were finished, that Moses commanded the Levites which bear the Ark of the Covenant, saying, Take this book of the law and put it in the side of the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God, that it may be there for a witness against thee. Now, the Ark of the Covenant is the center of all of the ritual, all of the sacrifice, and all of the order that goes on in God's house. It was, it was the central theme. That is the mercy seat where it was. And that was where God came and abided. And once a year that that sacrifice, that special unique sacrifice was made, atoning for the people and their sins. But this ritual and this sacrifice and this order all stays within the captivity of the witness of Scripture. And this is why God, I believe, had Moses send the Levites with the book that he had written, place it in the side of the Ark of the Covenant. It was there as a witness against them. It was also there affirming the ritual, affirming the sacrifice, affirming the order, and showing them the manner in which they were to do all those things. And it's amazing because though we don't have that Ark of the Covenant now as the center of our ritual, of our religion, of our faith and the order in which we do things, we certainly have those same words of God showing us the manner, being a witness against us. These scriptures show us what we ought to know and they grow us in the same way. The leadership came down from the word of God and that was actually the foundation of everything which they did. And this was the accumulation of Moses' ministry. Bring the word of God and those Ten Commandments down from the mount, present it to the people, and then over the course of time, penning down what we have, Genesis to Deuteronomy, so that we can go to what's known as the law. And we can seek therein, and we can hear, and we can learn, and we can fear the Lord, and we can observe to do everything that is in here. And when we fear Him and do everything we can that is in here, we're keeping the covenant of God. And we're, we're, le we're following after him and, and we are in that bond that he gives us by faith. Of course we're saved by faith. Grace through faith, plus nothing, minus nothing. That's how we believe and that's how we are saved. And that's where our salvation is sealed. But God still wants us to look to this perfect law of liberty and do all the things that are written therein that we may grow thereby. We can continue on in verse 27. And there's another stark reminder. It says, For I know thy rebellion and thy stiff neck. Behold, while I am yet alive with you this day, ye have been rebellious against the Lord. How much more after my death? Moses had this great fear that the floodgates were going to open on Joshua as soon as he passed away and as soon as he died in that mount. He had this great fear that the rebellion was somewhat restrained by his presence. And that can be a realistic fear. Parents have children and they grow up and they turn 19 years old and they, they, they start to live more independently and, and, and then the, the floodgates of their authority are, are opened and they're, they're on their own, they're their own man. And, and the worry can certainly be what Moses had here. What little rebellion maybe you see in a child and Moses here, what little rebellion he saw in the people of Israel, he was concerned that it would reach a breaking point and bust open after his death. Nevertheless, verse 28 continues, and his last ditch efforts and the final points of his ministry, Moses decides after giving Joshua the charge and the fullness of his honor to go forth and lead, Verse 28, gather unto me all the elders of your tribe and your officers that I may speak these words in their ears and call heaven and earth to record against them. 
So he brings in the leaders, the elders, the officers, the heads of the tribes to hear this final word from him in order that he could perhaps stave off the rebellion that he is fearing after his death. Verse 29 says, For I know that after my death you will utterly corrupt yourselves and turn aside from the way which I have commanded you. And evil will befall you in the latter days because ye will do evil in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger through the works of your hands. And notice he's not saying that evil will befall you because of some outside source. Evil befalls them because in the latter day they choose to do evil in the sight of God and provoke him to anger. And so he allows the evil to befall them in the latter day based on their own decision to rebel and disobey God. Verse 30, it says, And Moses spake in the ears of all the congregation of Israel the words of this song until it were ended. And as we get into this chapter next week, obviously, we'll hear the words of this song and we'll walk through it and we'll see what Moses from God received, gave to Joshua, charged to the people in order that when they heard it, they would remember it. It would be a witness and a testimony against them and draw them back into their proper place. The covenant with God, hearing him, learning from him, fearing him above all things and observing to do everything contained therein. Ultimately, his charge to the people is follow God. Be strong and of a good courage. Fear not, nor be afraid. Fear God above all things. Why? Because he is the one that's going to lead you. He doth go with thee. He will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. He will be the one that goes before thee. And Joshua here is receiving the charge to be essentially God's representative here. Going before the people. Ministering to the people and leading them according to all that is commanded unto Joshua at that time. And so this chapter then... That transfer's taken place. Succession is happening. We're passing things off. Mo God is obviously over everything. He's the head. He went to Moses and had Moses lead this people all of this time. And now Moses knows he is about to die because that's what God told him very specifically and plainly. So he gives this torch to Joshua to carry forth and is starting to give the same charges that he had heard himself. Be strong and of good courage. Press forward. It's a bleak story because we know that ultimately people are going to fall into rebellion and fall into wickedness and corrupt themselves and turn from God, but everything is being cared for carefully so that per adventure a remnant will be preserved. These elders, these officers, even a handful of them could carry forth in the way of God and stave off the rebellious trend that people always, always, always tend to follow when left to their own devices. And so then, again... Let's just reinforce this. This is why authority is so important. This is why all of us need to heed what's being taught us by those that are older than us, by those that are more experienced than us, by those that are given authority over us by the hand of God. We yield up to that authority and trust it and act according to what our, our conscience tells us and what they are teaching us. And then the same thing comes from the leadership. They ought to heed what God's teaching them and pass it down accordingly. And there's safety there and there's structure there and there's security there and there's succession there and a continuation. And that's ultimately what we need. And that's why we're in the state we are here in Canada because that never took place. Nobody ever taught their children who taught their children who taught their children the ways of God. Most people have long ago forsaken it. And therefore, anger kindled. They forsook God, he forsook them, and then what? Many evils and troubles befall a people that will head down that path. So here's the charge today. Be strong and of a good courage. Fear not, nor be afraid but choose to seek after God. Let him lead you. Let him lead you under the people that are also to be in leadership over you. And there is your safety, and there is your security, and there is your peace in this walk of life that we have before us. Be encouraged by this. You're not being pressed under a thumb. That government out there will press you under their thumb and oppress you. Human governments always tend in that direction, don't they? Authoritarian. But God here... Though he says he's going before them, you know what he also says? I will be with them. God isn't just trying to beat you down in order to make you submit to his will. No, he wants you to choose to submit to his will because he knows that's what's best for you. And you ought to resolve that in your heart that what God wants is absolutely what's best for you.
in every situation. Thank you, God, for this day, Lord. We thank you for your wonderful gift of